Let's take a peek at a Java program that is called the Greeting Machine. I have it up on my screen here, and it should look somewhat familiar. We need to get the, the flow and the overall structure of the Java programs in our hearts. So we've noticed that in Java, every line of code exists in a container. That container is called a class. Classes have names, and those names always start with a capital letter. So as we see on the screen, we're running a program, meaning we're running a set of commands to the computer that are grouped together in the class greeting machine. And I can issue an instruction to the computer through the NetBeans system to please compile and run this code. So I'm going to go ahead and do that as you've done before. I'm going to jump up to run. I'm going to say run file. Now one thing you'll notice, I'll add some tips for NetBeans as we go through, is there's two ways to run things. The first is to run a file or to run code as part of an entire project that could involve several files all grouped together and working together. Uh, we, for the first uh, couple of weeks, will be only running single files. And so we can avoid some errors that come when we try to run a bigger project by simply having the file open that we wish to run and then going to run, run file. Notice that NetBeans gives you shortcut keys on the right of the commands and the menus so that you can learn how to do these things quicker. So I just issued the run command. You'll notice that we need to find the output window. If for some reason you can't see the output window or it doesn't pop up automatically, the window menu gives you the chance to open those directly. So I can click output and it pulls it up if I can't find it. This program is running. It says with the prompt, please enter your name. All right, let's enter my name. My name is Eric. Whoa, Eric, what an interesting name card you have. This program was both compiled and executed on the computer. Let me show you the sequence that the computer takes to get that to happen. So we have a source code file that humans can read. So source code, and it exists in a file with a .java extension. We can think of Java files as the human readable version of the instructions. Now remember, computers only speak in binary, ones and zeros. Strings of ones and zeros, millions, billions of ones and zeros. So something needs to happen to turn words that are in um, English words and characters into ones and zeros. And that is a, a two-step process in Java. So the source code lives in a .java file. In that file, we need to have a class. Like I mentioned, all Java code exists in a bundle called a class. We feed this source code file into a program, a computer program, that is called the compiler. The compiler is a program, it's actually written in the language called C, that exists on your computer, that knows how to read Java files, and it spits out something called bytecode. Bytecode is not human readable. It's designed to be ingested or uh, run by another program called the Java Virtual Machine. The Java Virtual Machine is responsible for interacting with the processor on your computer to actually get the, uh, the program to do what you've asked it to. So our step one is to feed our source code into the compiler. If the compiler is happy with our code, it will spit out bytecode. That bytecode exists in files that have a dot class extension to them. So we normally will, or we never, we will never edit a .class file. We will only edit .java files because those are the only things that we as humans know how to read. It is conceivable that you could write in bytecode, but this is not something that people do except as an academic exercise. So we have .class files 
and those go into our Java virtual machine. So why a multi-step process? Why do I need to know anything about this if I never read class files? And the answer is the key insight that Java developers had was that we need a language that can run on any type of computer. Windows, Mac, Unix, Linux, even on mobile computers these days. The way that they've done that is created Java virtual machines that are specific to an operating system or we'd say a platform specific Java virtual machine. So when you downloaded the Java virtual machine last week you selected it based on the operating system that you're running. When you type the source code in, you don't have to make any changes to the source code. You can write a program and compile it and feed those .class files into a Java virtual machine running on any computer. So this is universal in the sense that it is platform independent, operating system independent, or we'd say platform neutral. The Java virtual machine, however, is platform specific. It's a lot easier to write Java virtual machines that might only need to be tweaked a little bit to move between operating systems rather than writing an entire different version of the language and publishing different documentation sets depending on where you're going to run that code. This sounds quite um, like why is this such a big insight now that we're used to computers where you can send files between computers quite easily? It's rare these days that we even have to think about what operating system the receiving computer is running. This is a relatively new innovation. When Java was first developed in the 90s, it was not the case. A language was actually specific to a platform. It was not universal. And so the, tra the transfer of uh, computer programs between operating systems was quite an enormous task. Sometimes you had to translate it into an entirely different language. These steps in NetBeans are accomplished together. So when I say run in NetBeans, What's going on in the background is it is managing the sending of our Java files into the compiler and then taking that bytecode from the compiler and sending it into the virtual machine that NetBeans knows how to work with. It's in fact managing that virtual machine. And the output window that we see on the screen is connected to that virtual machine. So a lot of this work is done for us. It's important to know why it's being, or that it is being done in the background because the day will come when we will want to think about moving the class files around when we may not even have the source code and we might just have class files. So understanding the background, the guts if you will, of how a Java program works is important. So with that, I am going to conclude this little segment. In the week ahead, I would like you to work through the module one, which is the Java language essentials. Let's just take a peek at what those objectives are. So I want you to be able to have a confidence of this life cycle. I gave you a nice little diagram in here for it. And um, we will be learning about how to manipulate that Java code and organize it into packages and classes. The second module this week, module two, gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how you can use other people's code. So this will actually walk you through loading code from NetB or from GitHub.